Hey there, what's your gift? Hello there and welcome to Magic by Design. We are dipping back into the world of Disney features this week with a review of the studio's 60th animated feature in Kanto in theatres now. But before we pay a visit to Casita Madrigal to break down the latest film in the Disney animated canon, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Ken and I am joined as always by my co-host slash brother, he's Garrett. Gar, how are you? I definitely have no gift. I would definitely be one of these people who go up to the door and everyone's like, ooh, we built the whole day around this and I'd walk up to the door and I'd put my hand on the door knob and the door would just disappear yeah and be like no thank you my gift sure as hell isn't podcasting well you know i just i do it a lot that yeah. doesn't mean i'm good at it <laughs> i was about to say you're persistent at it whether you're good or not who knows whether i'm good or not who knows thoroughly a quantity over quality approach here to podcasting in my life and well, that's a volume business care yeah you just churn out until a streaming service picks up all of your content and pays you millions of dollars because that's how this works right Sure. You just become a content farm. That's all I am. A farm for content. I said farm weirdly the first time. Well, farm. you did it now. I'm not going to edit that out. I've said it two different ways now. So people can, again, if, if you want multiple takes of me when I do eventually die and you would like to put together that, that thing where you can just have an algorithm do my voice, at least now there's multiple versions of farm so it could sound more authentic. Someday Magic by Design will be done by a Gar hologram. It'll just sound like Wally. Wally! It's like, good point, Gar. Better point than usual Gar makes, and you're just saying Wally all over her again. Before we get too deep into the podcast, we're going to issue a warning now. There are spoilers ahead, so if you haven't seen the movie yet, you might want to park this one for a bit until you watch it. We are 80 watt episodes into this show. 84. So you know how these episodes go. <laughs> but of course, this is a new movie, which we saw today in the cinema so yeah spoilers obviously we're gonna talk all about the end of the movie have you stopped listening why haven't you stopped listening are you still there this is disney's 60th movie here they put a little graphic on the screen they did a little animated this is our 60th animated feature well i have to say i was initially wary when i saw the film's poster because it depicts the main character mirabelle with a pose and a face that's a mixture of well that happened and can you believe my kooky family? This is definitely like a live action Disney Channel show, you know? Yeah. If you took out the magic stuff and just like, here's my super strength sister, here's my super hearing sister, here's my like uh, very pretty sister. And they actually, for the most part, all have powers that would like be pretty easy to do in live action. Like obviously the being extraordinarily pretty and I suppose she can create flowers and the hearing one, like you don't need to do any CGI for the ability to hear. That's great. Well, that's good for the inevitable stage adaptation. Yeah, and when they make a Disney Channel live action show, which, to be fair, I'd probably watch. I'd, I'd take a look on Disney+. Plus. Well, they're all on Disney+. Plus now. Did you know they got rid of the Disney Channel? They did. I was very upset when I found that out. I was like, oh, I thought they'd just leave it there. I like the Disney... I like randomly watching old episodes of Good Luck Charlie, as opposed to going on Disney+, Plus and actually clicking play on the episodes of Good Luck Charlie. Yeah, you want to come across them by chance I, I think i found out when i looked for the disney channel and it wasn't there but it kind of makes sense i suppose they're cannibalizing their own business if they keep it there or are they marketing their own business true they can like like pull out certain things and be like you want to see the rest of it or the good episodes go to disney plus i would have thought like that that's that would be my thought process it's like oh it's like a good marketing vehicle for disney plus where you can be very choosy about what you put on it yeah when you put it that way it makes sense even like you can keep all the new stuff off of the tv channel and as i said just air good luck charlie replays with disney plus ads and there you go job done kids will watch that i'll watch that like i want to randomly stumble across the episode of good luck charlie that has the muppets in it because the muppet song is actually pretty good in that episode i don't remember that one you have to look it up on youtube it's a kermit song it's quite good encanto is directed by byron Howard and Jared Bush in their first movie since Magic by Design favourite Zootopia slash Zootropolis. Very good movie. It's also co-directed by Charisse Castro-Smith with the script written by Bush and Smith. The story section. Six people. Yeah. Which makes me think it's somewhat, fair enough, only two on the screenplay, but it feels a little like story by committee. Yeah, I can see what you mean by that. And I think that kind of comes true in the movie in that I think... To get right into Encanto, before we talk about the short, actually, because I want to talk about the short before we get into the movie. But I think, on the whole, this movie is perfectly fine. And good. But just good. And it feels a very manufactured Disney kind of good. It's like, we do the I Want song, we do the character introduction song, we do uh, each character gets their own song, bing, bang, bong, done. And, like, it's all good, it's all perfectly fine, functional Disney animated musical, but you've seen all of it before. Yeah, it's got all the pieces that we've identified through watching all these movies over the last two years. 
well, nearly two years now. Yeah, it's, it's a perfectly polished piece of Disney animation, but I didn't find myself connecting to it that much. Maybe a bit towards the end. Yeah, they took in the heartstrings toward the end. I think the songs are mostly fine. We will say, for some reason, there's just something about we saw this in a cinema that didn't seem to have great speakers for the songs. Because I listened back to it on Spotify and the songs are perfectly legible. It's not it's not a, a movie issue. But the, the, the theatre we saw this in didn't have great speakers, so like 40% of the lyrics in the songs were like, completely unintelligible yeah i thought i had suffered from hearing loss <laughs> yeah i was, I was like, like what What are they saying literally i had to start focusing i'm like what what you say is it is it that i've gotten so old as i approach my 30s that there's a high pace like lin-manuel miranda like his his, his uh, rapid fire cadence of his lyrics it's like have i gotten so old that i can't actually hear it and like no when i listen to those and it is fast but it's apparently too fast for the speakers in the gate cinema in cork <laughs> As you noted, Gar, Encanto is a musical with songs from a little-known songwriter called Lin-Manuel Miranda. People are sick of him, aren't they? Yeah, he's around a lot. He's ubiquitous. It's one of those people, it's the James Corden effect. Where you're, like, you don't dislike James Corden, really because of anything James Corden does. Not a great actor, but you know. His show, his TV show is perfectly affable and fine. Everyone dislikes James Corden because he's everywhere. He the, doesn't leave us alone. The Friends reunion, he's there. That new Cinderella movie, he's there. Cats, prom. There. He has his own show. The Friends reunion was my, like, straw that broke the camel's back moment with James Corden. I would have been like, ah, you know, leave him alone. He's just doing his his job. But but then when he showed up in the Friends reunion, I'm like, fuck off. Would you ever just go away, James Corden? You do not have to be in everything. What is the point of you being here? And the answer is because he's available. And money. I do want to talk about the short before we talk about the movie. Far From the Tree, the short that aired uh, before the movie, which there's a short before all these movies, but we never talk about them because we never see them in the cinema. But we saw this in the cinema and it has a short. The first point I want to make, 2D. Yeah. Ah, it was so nice. I actually got goosebumps when I was just like, 2D animation on a big screen from Disney. Yeah, and they've been experimenting with that more and more with with the shorts. Not even experimenting, to your point, going back to their roots. And it was just a a welcome change of pace because everything is 3D these days. Yeah, it was just so nice to get some 2D animation out of Disney. It's only a short. It's only five or six minutes. And it's a perfectly functional little short again about um, the rodent evil things. Raccoons? Raccoons, there you go. Um, Like some likable raccoons, which don't exist. But they're they're literally tiny thieves can. They wear masks. What do they have to hide but yeah it's a, it's a nice lovely short but i was i was watching this short and thinking because the idea of this short is there is a parent who is too harsh on their child and their child gets in danger because he rebels against the harsh parent who wants them to stay in the cave and the child naturally wants to explore and then you see the second generation of that where the the child has grown up to be an adult and he's doing the same thing to his kid and eventually he realizes you know that's not how you parent you have to let children explore and uh, encourage their imagination and then teach them how to look after themselves he or she can't. that's true we do not know the genders of any of these raccoons but i was thinking watching that being like this basically narrows down the plot of a good 40 percent of disney movies where it's like overbearing parent rebellious child and they come to understand each other and then i started watching this movie (laughs) i started watching encanto and i was like oh it's not is it (laughs) like it's not the case that this entire movie is the like 90 minute version of the six minute short we just watched and my my thought process watching that short was like oh you can just do this story in six minutes you know (laughs) you don't need the whole like whatever Encanto is it's probably longer than 90 it's uh, 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 110 only slightly longer I had the same thought like if you put them side by side, the main theme, which is generational trauma, I suppose, or that kind of... Um, it's not generational trauma. Uh, yeah, because... There's like, no trauma involved. Because the raccoon in the first part had their eye scratched out by the wolf and therefore was cautious with their child. And then the child rebels and then has a similar experience where they get a scar across their nose from said wolf and then treat their kid the same. So... It's generational trauma, but then there's that generational not understanding each other. and It's more misunderstanding than trauma, because the trauma, it's like, there are scary, angry things there. <laughs> the, the, the parent is right to protect the child. Yeah, he does turn out to be right uh, uh, in the first half of the short. Yeah. Just going about it the wrong way. But I, I, it could be. it's only because I was sitting there watching that short thinking, you can do this story, like, so efficiently, that when they were doing the exact same thing in Encanto, I was like, oh no... <laughs> Are, are you really doing the much longer version of this exact same story you delivered to me in the short? And in theory, they're like, oh yeah, the, the, these two things, they work together. They're pieces that complement each other. But I think it's kind of the opposite. I think the short kind of undermines the movie. Yeah, I had a very similar thought because like putting them side by side, oh yeah, similar themes. So maybe that's why they put them together. But as you said, they distilled it into six minutes. 
and we've already seen it before the main event. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it somewhat makes you think that, as you said, this is a short premise stretched over 90 minutes. Yeah, and it's a, and it's, it's a cliched one as well, because like that's the reason I was like, oh, it's kind of interesting to see this very stock standard Disney idea that we've seen in so many movies, like The Little Mermaid, or we've seen in Brave. It's like all these people who want more, who rebel against their parent, who wants to keep them kind of caged up. And uh, like... To see it distilled down to something very easy to digest and then just repeat it again goes back to my point, film by committee. It's like your standard, she's not a princess, but your standard Disney princess who is being held back by, in this case, her grandmother and is rebelling against her. And I think we've seen two movies in a row like this now where it just felt like reminiscent of other films and put together from, you know, that kind of committee Oh yeah, we saw it in Luca as well, and we saw it in Coco, and we like it's their go-to plot. The kid rebels against the overprotective parent. But I'm thinking Rhea and the Last Dragon. Oh, it's there too. They have one story. Would they stop it? And again, if I probably wouldn't even talk about this. I probably wouldn't even like notice this as a theme. Were it not for that short, where I'm like, oh, they, it's kind of neat that they distilled their entire one idea that they put into every movie down to a, a, an efficient piece of storytelling. And then they just went and did the same story they do over and over again, once again. Moana, the, the same story. God, they just do the one story. The overbearing, protective parents. Angry, rebellious child. Anyway, in November... <laughs> in November, Swiftly moving on from undermining Disney's entire creative efforts. <laughs> in November 2016, Miranda revealed that John Lasseter, then Chief Executive Officer of Disney Animation Studios, had presented an idea for an animated project to himself and Byron Howard, while on the press junket for his previous collaboration with Disney, Moana. Make way, make way. In January 2020, it was reported that the studios were developing an animated film centred on a Latino family, And in June that year, a tentative, which ended up being the final title, was revealed to be Encanto. While reports said that the film would be set in Brazil, Miranda stated on June 22nd of 2020 that it would actually be set in Colombia, which makes no difference to the movie whatsoever. No, it's set in a nondescript rainforest that is probably South America based on the fact that they're speaking Spanish. In December last year, the project was officially confirmed at a Disney Investor Day meeting. Again, everyone's favourite place. Everyone tunes in to the investor conferences to be like, oh, we need the financial earnings. We need uh, to know how Disney did this year. How many Disney Plus subscribers do they have? And then, of course, revealing the movies to me. During that meeting, a clip was shown and a release of fall 2020 or autumn, if you're from the side of the world, was announced. They didn't hit that, did they? Magical realism was also referenced, which basically means stuff happens and it doesn't make any sense. No, it means it's it's magic in a real world setting. But I I love the idea that they're showing the clip to the investors. They're like, "Mm -hmm." you know, I'm going to put more money into Disney stock. How much money is this going to make me? I'm so invested in this Encanto they're showing me. Encanto was released on November 24th and is on track to be a financial success, having earned an estimated 123 million worldwide off a budget of 120 to 150 million. Disney have opted for an exclusive 30-day theatrical run, at least in the US, I'm not sure about worldwide, before Disney Plus exclusive release in response to the uncertainty of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's up to 151 million since you took the notes. <laughs> wow. But that's that's probably just this weekend's gross being added into it, which like sounds like a giant flop because it's been out for three weeks now, but COVID. <laughs> Yeah, you're looking at 180 to 225 based on the estimates of the budget to make a profit. So it's getting there. Yeah, and, you know, it'll make money on Disney+. Plus. It'll make money through merchandise. It'll be fine. But it's like, it's a different world. People are like, Ghostbusters flopped. It's like, did it. Even if this movie made like $10 million, you're still like, the state of the world. Come on. It made over $35 million, Ghostbusters. So, like, everyone's happy to make whatever they can on these things before they turn them into the streaming machines. And, like... Except no one wants to go to the cinema except us. Actually, you know, there was six people there other than us. Critics are fans of Encanto so far with particular praise for the film's gorgeous animation, songs and heart. Gorgeous animation, you say? I think it's fairly stock based on what Disney have done in the last couple of films. Yeah, I think there's much better, more imaginative looking films. Like we just watched Luca, which is it's obviously Pixar, but it's a sensational looking film. Like just gorgeous. It has a real sense of place. It's just a stunning looking film. And I think this was the same problem with Raya as well. It's just like generic Asian place, generic South American place. It could be 
absolutely anywhere. It has no real identity. Now, the house we'll go into. The house is interesting, but the environment of the Encanto itself, we don't see much of it, but it could be anywhere. Yeah, and like we, we have a South American village in Coco, which was so much better realised. Like that 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 same kind of general visual aesthetic. And then you go into the, the world of the dead, the land of the dead part of Coco, which is like drop dead gorgeous, absolutely stunning, insane level of detail. And that's, it's disappointing from these two directors, from the directors of Zootopia, which I think we would agree is the at least the most dense of the Disney films. It's like there's so much detail in every frame of the animation of of Zootopia and then to come to this and it's it's fine. Yeah, we had a lot of praise for the world of Zootopia, all the different areas, the, the minor details and Again, this feels like something that was created. You know, we referenced the shareholders there as like, let's churn out something that will appeal to a certain demographic. The last two films have been a bit cynical in that sense because, you know, Asian Americans and Latin Americans are becoming a big demographic in the US. They're saying that in the next few years, Latin Americans won't even be a minority anymore. You know what? It's a sign of progress, truly, that all demographics are getting, like, committee-churned-out pieces of entertainment that don't have a soul. <laughs> no. That's that's the true progress. So it's like when we're representing everybody with mediocre art. <laughs> now, I will say, I did like the animation of the house and it being a character in the movie. And, like, the, some of the flower effects are quite nice, you know, and flowers are springing up everywhere. And as you said, the cute animal sidekick in this movie is a house. <laughs> The entire house is the cute animal sidekick. Like, the house is alive, so it helps them when they have problems, and it's like a little helper. Like, you can see, you know, when Mirabelle is going to go out and help keep the magic alive, it helps her put on her shoes, and it's just like uh, a sentient house in, in not a creepy way. <laughs> yeah, what's actually, you know, yeah, you could make a decent horror movie around the idea of this kind of sentient house, couldn't you? I and not like the smart house idea, but like literally a house where the windows have personality. But I, I liked like the doors. I thought that was a nice concept that shows you if their powers are active and strong. And like these are more like story elements of animation as opposed to like the house didn't look particularly pretty either. You know, it's it's not a striking house from a visual perspective, but like the animation touches the character of the animation is quite interesting. But like the actual visual draw as again you said whatever it was, draw dropping animation is like, no it's not. Go watch some of the recent movies this company has put out and you will see like watch Soul and watch the Earth sequences in Soul and you will see a depiction of New York that is so realistic that it will literally drop your jaw as opposed to this which is your stock Disney 3D animation. It doesn't actually look that nice. And it's interesting like again we we went from all the Disney films then to all the Pixar films with I think we had a break for Raya or did we do Raya while we were still doing Disney? I think we might have. Yeah back to back. Yeah it released right towards the end of when we were getting there before we went into pixar and like like pixar are still lapping disney it's so weird they're the same company what's the difference yeah you think they'd share creatives to raise both boats in a sense but no pixar are just like oh yeah we're so good at this why are you not as good at this they do a kind of a tardis effect for the rooms they're bigger on the inside literally the line they're bigger on the inside which i'm sure popped you yeah i liked that whole concept you know we saw three of the rooms i would have actually liked to see more of the rooms hmm I think they were like, no, three is enough. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're doing enough here in this movie. We don't need to, like, depict the transforming guy's room. What would it even look like? True, it's like, because, you know, we see that um, Bruno's room is a temple, more or less, because he needs the space for his visions. And then Isabel's room, Isabella or Isabel? Isabel, uh, Isabel? I don't know. Anyway, Isabella, there's an A. Yeah. yeah, we see her room is a, a floral paradise and Antonio, when he gets his power, is like a, a, a dense jungle for all his animals. So, yeah, they they do some interesting stuff with that. And I, I, I did like the whole concept of the powers and the rooms and the house and all that. But then they don't really explain where any of it came from or why it's being maintained or why it's starting to fail. And we'll go into that in the story as well. And like, I'm OK with that again. It's just it's plot stuff. I don't know. It's like it's like we talked about this with Luca. It's like they never explain the lore behind. The, the sea monsters and why they turn into people like they never explain that and I'm fine it's like they never explain where, where the magic candle came from it just came from I have a theory but we'll get into it as you said the animation of some of the magic and powers was nice you know especially around Isabella's powers and you know even Luisa there's some good visual gags out of her super strength and stuff like that yeah and like the, the weather effects I think is a cool idea of like the just rain and snow popping in depending on somebody's mood so overall I think it's it's enjoyable animation, but I think it's more functional than beautiful. 
Yeah, it's just it does the job. But going from as I said, the back to back one two punch of Soul and and Luca, which are like legitimately stunning looking movies, and we've talked about how Pixar have really started pushing the boundaries of the quality of their animation ever since probably The Good Dinosaur, or it's like oh god, you're so good at this now, and it it is very weird to me that like. It's, it's all Disney. It's all the same company. Why is one of your animation studios so much nicer looking than the other? And maybe it is like that by committee effect. Like Pixar have more personality, whereas Disney are just, we're going to make broad mass entertainment. And that's the reason we're not going to put any character or personality. But again, Zootopia, such a cool looking film. So they come to this and have a less cool looking film. That's sad. I will say though, the choreography of the dinner prep during We Don't Talk About Bruno, like that would look good on a stage for... Uh, a stage adaptation of this but they choreograph it in, a, in animation which I thought was actually quite impressive you know what this actually shares a theme with Luca in that the primary theme is Silencio Bruno yeah but both both very much enjoy shutting up Bruno yeah I, th- I, th- I thought it was a nod and a wink maybe it wasn't conscious but it was funny Moving on here to the story, Gar, I would say like it's more pronounced here in that generational trauma and how it transfers to future generations is more apparent here than mm-hmm. just the conflict between family members. Because because the grandmother is literally like projecting her trauma on everybody else. And like her understandable trauma, because the most interesting thing about this is like the entire magical family is they're displaced migrants. Yes. You know, they're displaced migrants from what seems to be some kind of violent political coup. And it's apparent Apparently in Colombia, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's not established in the movie, but we're told in by Lin Manuel Miranda it's Colombia, so I'll take his word for it. So they're displaced migrants. Her husband dies trying to escape to a better life. That's where I think the miracle came from. It's like a Harry Potter act of love type of scenario. Mm, so so then the magic candle comes up, and then the city uh, like grows based on that kind of love. And I I have some questions about that, Ken. Go ahead. So we have the city, which we are kind of told is isolated from the rest of the world. Like like when that sacrifice happens, when the candle is created, when the house comes popping up out of nowhere, you see like the giant mountains circle around this like hidden village. In Canto. Canto. Yeah. And then we learn that there has been two generations of people within this enclosed group. So I would begin to ask questions over time, surely they have to inbreed, right? Well, it seems that there was a fairly big group with uh, Abuela Alma. It seems like 30. Yeah, uh, yeah, but it's not that big, though. I could see generations popping up. Mm. But maybe. So you're saying they can avoid the inbreeding here in this closed society? One of the themes that came up for me, though, was how sometimes when the oppressed become powerful, they can cling to it and lose sight of what's important to the detriment of others. So... Abuela Alma goes a bit mad with power. For, it's not for, even for, mad with power. It's more over... It's again, it's the overprotectiveness. Yeah, for fear of losing control. Like, uh, if we want to use an, an example that's close to home for us, we would have been marginalised people when we went abroad in the past, the Irish. Mm. And then we basically threw the black population of America to the wolves. Yeah. It became policemen, became, you know, white, for want of a better term. We were... A minority. The quote-unquote pillars of the community. Yeah, we bought her... (laughs) Quote-unquote. We bought her whiteness with the blood of African-Americans. So it's interesting how over time, people who are marginalised, if they become the dominant people, can forget... They just marginalise other people again. Exactly. You would think they're the first to understand. It's like, well, we were treated like... (laughs) Maybe we shouldn't treat us... Nah, we've gotten power now, so we're going to treat us like... (laughs) To maintain our power. But like, that, that... There is a malice in that example. Like, but there, there is not a malice in the Abuela's actions in this movie. The fur, it couldn't be further from the case. Like, she is trying to be overly protective. She's taking on the burden of too many people, and then passing that burden onto her children to to keep the town safe, to provide for the town, to do all of the town's bidding, and maybe overly provide for the town so that the town can't really, in many ways, provide for themselves. But it, it, like, there, there's no malice to her actions in this movie. She is, she is acting in good faith. Yeah, but I think she's over the years become cold Mm. because, you know, she's lost a lot. She hasn't really processed it. She's gone from having her life ripped away from her to having this miracle. And so she's fully dived into that and clinging on to it. So her kids are tools. 
<laughs> like yeah. that's effectively the case like everyone gets their power and then they use their power in the community and it's like do they have any time for themselves do they have any like personal time do they have a choice to opt out of this like system it's like no you get your power and then you use your super strength to straighten some buildings and carry some donkeys and that is your role and if you do not fulfill that role i will be disappointed in you i did want to shout multiple times at the movie though that the cracks are a metaphor <laughs> yeah it's like come on it's just one of those things where it's like obviously the cracks are a metaphor for the cracks in the family not the cracks in the power it's the divisions in the family that's causing divisions in the power not like the power is waning that the family is waning and i just wanted somebody to be like well maybe it's the fact we're not getting along and that comes from abuela because she stops seeing them as family members she even says it at the end in a moment of revelation she sees them as tools And if they're not performing to their optimum level, she's very cold and distant towards them to the point where she pushes Mirabelle away. She doesn't see Mirabelle as having any value and actively tells her, stay out of this. You're not helping, so you're not worth anything. You know what I think needed to happen in this movie, though? I think Abuela needed to know the prophecy because I think she is just very needlessly cruel to Mirabelle. And if she she knew the prophecy that that or the vision that Bruno saw that Mirabelle will be either the savior or the person who destroys the family, I think her actions toward her would make a lot more more sense that it's like i think you are going to destroy this family so i'm sidelining you at every opportunity whereas we understand she doesn't know the prophecy or that the it's a vision it's not a prophecy that she doesn't know the, the vision she only learns the vision like halfway through the movie so i'm just like oh you were just being mean to her for no reason yeah. she she is not useful as a tool because she didn't get magic powers so you were going to ostracize her and criticize her at all times and it's like oh or it's like i think it would have been a much more understandable character beat if she knew the vision she and that's the reason she was trying to like ostracize and sideline mirabelle because she's so afraid that her miracle will be taken away from her. Mm. That's a small but but actually very significant change, Gary. I think that would have made much more sense. I think it would have done Abuela more justice as a character, as opposed to being just like, you're really a borderline stereotypical cruel grandmother, you know? So we talked about the themes of expectations and the pressure that comes with them. It's a classic Disney thing, though, isn't it? Yeah, and... It goes to, as I said, goes to Brave, it goes to Little Mermaid, it goes to all these people who are wanting more in their lives and don't want to deal with the burden. But also, you know, people being shoved into a role that they're not comfortable with or they never had a choice to have. And while I I can agree with you that's been played out in a lot of Disney movies, it is something that still resonates a lot with me as someone, you know... (laughs) Ken is like, I've seen it like 17 times down to the pretty much exact same I want song, but it works, so I don't care. As a millennial, I'm like, yeah... I get it. People expect a lot out of you. And I do want. I do want. I want to be different. I don't want I don't want to work in an office, but... You don't work in an office. You work at home. A home office. Gar, I have a question, though. Why do you think the magic was fading? It was but, the cracks in the family. It's the family is falling apart so that the magic is falling apart. It's that simple. It gives Antonio a gift, though, after not giving Mirabel one. Is it to teach... Abuela Alma the lesson she failed to learn with Mirabelle or did they make it like was it a conscious choice by the magic to not give Mirabelle uh, a power because she needs someone in that family that's grounded to keep them all together I don't know is the magic sentient is the magic just the grandfather could be because like the, the there is the first time Mirabelle sees the cracks it does run through the painting of the grandfather not at all subtly but is is it just like the the ma- manifestation of the spirit of the grandfather yeah that's where my theory that the act of love created the miracle and now that the love is waning that that's where the magic is waning that makes sense yeah and i think he if we're saying he it's him right mm-hmm. he consciously didn't give Mirabelle a power because you need someone who doesn't have power to keep the other people grounded and have them see that the power is not the most important thing. Well, like the entire top point of this movie is that we're all special in our own way, regardless of whether we have magic powers. Which, to take us to the ending, Ken, they get their magic back. Yeah. Cop I, out or no cop out? I felt they were about to stick the landing right up until they brought the magic back. Yeah. I understand that it was to facilitate Mirabelle's moment, right? And like the house is a character in the movie. So then you kind of would have to think, well, the house died. <laughs> yeah. I don't think they needed it anymore anymore and the message of the strength of the Encanto coming from family and the community would have been stronger because we see like we get a we, you know the community comes to help them rebuild the casita says mm-hmm. like oh we know we don't have powers but you looked after us all these years and you've you've given us so much work when I help you so like the strength was in the family and the community and I think the lesson would have been stronger if it's like look we had these things but actually we don't need them yeah and the thing that really brought us together all along was family and that's what we forgot and that's what we will thrive on now and we do not need the magic powers anymore even though we did need them at the time 
And yeah, I'm firmly in the cop-out camp. And the only reason I think they did it is, very cynically, the sequel is less interesting if they don't have magic powers. True. And if they ever want to do a sequel, they have to leave that door open. Because like, they do I, they do right, they like literally pull a fast one at the very last second of the movie almost. It's just like, oh yeah, magic power is back again, everyone's happy. It's like, God, guys, come on. But I legitimately think there is a meeting in some Disney boardroom where they're like, all right, so our ending here, do we give them back the magic powers? And someone's like, you know, for the sake of the story, I think it's better if they don't get their magic powers back so that they truly learn the lesson of the movie. And then some other Disney executive is like, yeah, but if we make a sequel, <laughs> and there you go, that's all that matters. Matters. But yeah, the, I think the story, the message of the story works much, much better if they don't get their magic powers back. And it's a kind of a cop out to kind of undermines the point that they do get their magic powers back. I think we had a similar point about Raya as well, where they all come together at the end as if like nothing ever happened. And like happily ever after, I can't remember the joint country that they came back together as, but it's like, yeah, we learned our lesson. We're all friends now. And all these deeply seated generational political issues are in the past. Yeah, so cop out, guys. Stakes. I get, it's a children's movie. So, like, it's meant to have a happy ending, but it had a happy ending. Like, you didn't need to undermine the stakes of the movie. You didn't need to undermine the message of the movie just for the sake of, again, sequels. It's, it's sequels. That's all it's for, which is a shame. I have one last question for you, Gar, on the story. Does Encanto need a villain? The film hangs its hat on the family tension, and I get the origins of the conflict and the turmoil of being the cornerstone of this community, but it does lack momentum at times. So, like, something along the lines of someone steals the magic. Nah. You know, I, like, I think the story they told is better than that. If they had actually followed through with it. Yeah, I, I'm, I like, I, I, t- I still think it's pretty generic, but there's nothing I think about this movie a villain would have made better. And the villain, like, the movie does set up a villain. It's meant, it's like, it's Bruno. Bruno's the villain. He's the one we don't talk about. He's the man who saw the future and ran away. And then we learn that he's actually hiding in the, the freaking walls and uh, has developed a neurotic tick. But. And he has rats for friends. Yeah. I, I like Bruno. I think he's Bruno's a fun character. Voiced by John Luciziamo. Very good performance. I don't know who that is, but sure. He was Luigi in the live action Super Mario Bros. movie. Oh, yeah. Good for him having like a real. <laughs> oh, and Sid the Sloth from Ice Age. I liked him in Ice Age. All right, I'm a fan of John Luciziamo. Ca- before we go on, how does he not cast a man named John Luciziamo in Luca? <laughs> well, he's, he's of Spanish heritage, I'm pretty sure. Oh, that makes more sense. <laughs> Why did he play Luigi? I don't know. Le- to be fair, it's a fairly understandable thing to think a guy with the name Luigiamo who played Luigi in the Super Mario Bros. movie is Italian. Moving on here, regard to the film's music and score, Encanto is very much a standard break into song musical. Mm-hmm. Lin Manuel Miranda, who most recently wrote songs for Moana, as we said, was brought back for Encanto. Miranda began writing the movie songs in June last year. He ended up writing eight songs in both English and Spanish. Jermaine Franco, who co composed composed the songs in Coco, created the film's score, and John Powell, who scored Bolt, is credited as a consultant. I'm trying to think of, like, I can't remember any of the score of this movie. Yeah. Like, uh, literally none of it. I listened to some of it earlier. It's a very standard American animation adventure movie score. Which is a shame, because, like, literally walking out of the movie, you and I were still humming the Lucas score. Yeah. <laughs> like, a week after we watched it, and after having just seen a different Disney movie, we were like, oh, yeah, Luca. Yeah, I think the quality of the sound in the cinema coloured my initial thoughts on these songs. I didn't enjoy a lot of them. But as much as, on a second listen, there are some toe tappers, there's some good pop songs, There's some good musical songs. I think it does stack up unfavorably to Moana. Yeah, and like, listen, I didn't like the Frozen 2 songs, and now I like the Frozen 2 songs. So they might be growers, I'll give them time. But coming out, there's no song here that's been added to a Spotify playlist, I'll tell you that much. But maybe there will be over time. Like the Family Madrigal, it's your standard Introduce the Characters song. Waiting on a Miracle is your standard I Want song. Then you get the series of character songs, which I, I quite like some of them like surface pressure i think is a good song i like louisa's song i like the fact that it is a kind of a your recognizable musical in that each character has a moment where they just burst into song which can be quite jarring at times but it's funny i think that's a, a good one and also we don't talk about bruno they all have these kind of motifs it's a very musical theater song like you can see that song being performed on stage with everyone popping in with their little bit yeah but like uh the drip 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 part of louisa's song there's the no 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 of bruno's song so like all these little motifs are there and like it is i think do you know what? I think I'd like to see Encanto on, on the stage. I think yeah, it'd be a good time. And like you can see, I think the, the house would work tremendously as a set. It would. So they would probably make a good stage musical. I like What Else Can I Do as well. The 
the sisters' song as they come together. Yeah, I think that's a, a very good duet. And fair play to Stephanie Beatrice, who plays... I didn't know it was her. Yeah. I was looking at the Wikipedia page. I was like, oh! <laughs> she plays Mirabel. Now, I'm used to hearing her as Rosa Diaz. And I know that's not her real voice. Yeah, it's a very particular kind of performance. So I actually, I realise now, like, I have no idea what she sounds like. Exactly. Always- so it's like, it doesn't sound like her. You can hear her at times. But I, I realised, like, that's probably closer to her real voice and Diaz is not. Like, Diaz is a completely different kind of performance, yeah. But my point is, she sings in this movie. Yeah, good on uh, fair play to her. And, you know, she's not, like, Mariah Carey, but very admirable performance in a lot of these songs. Yeah, good effort. Especially you could say, I didn't realise it was her. So overall, I think Encanto, to your point, needs a bit of time in terms of the songs. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to make a judgment now. I've only listened to them twice. Yeah. And as I said, there are some I gravitate towards. and I think they will grow on me. But in the cinema, it just wasn't a good experience between the poor sound system and the fact that it was kind of a very standard format. Yeah, it's like, as I said, there's the introduction song. I want song, characters, songs, and then you're out. It's like, there, there's no kind of song you haven't heard. It's a very, as I said, every element of this movie, I think, feels by committee. It's like, this is our Disney template and we're doing it. And I, I think we talked about that, like, with Tarzan, I think it was, that it was like, this is our template and we're doing it, but it was good and it also had Phil Collins songs. So, I don't know. Maybe it's just I'm tired of the Disney formula. Maybe it's if you have kids who have never seen a Disney movie and they go see this one and is it one of their first ones, they'll probably love it because, again, we're cynical, jaded old men who have watched every single one of these movies in the last, like, year and a half. And we're just like, oh, it's this, it's this, it's this. We've seen it all before. But, you know, maybe kids will enjoy it. Kids will enjoy this movie. This is It's yeah. a kid's movie and kids will like it. It's colourful and vibrant, so why and, not? And they won't get mad at them undercutting the stakes at the end. So we normally talk now about the legacy or, or any points of note. Encanto is a brand new film, so its legacy has yet to be written yeah it's but, legacy has been out for like i don't know 15 days <laughs> so but longer. where does this film lie in the disney canon for you and would it be viewed as significant or important in years to come for you um no but you know what it's fine <laughs> you know it's it's fine it's a good movie and it's nothing more and there's nothing about it that's like truly remarkable but there's absolutely nothing about it that's bad either so it's your middle of the road decent disney formula movie which means it's going to be pretty forgettable come the time you, if we ever read it our rankings or whatever. Like, it wouldn't break top 10. Might not even break top 20. That's the kind of movie we're talking about here. It's probably somewhere in the 20s to 30s. And it's it's a good time. Like, I, I, we've been kind of harsh on it. If you go see it, you'll sit there. There's some decent songs, some decent characters, some decent animation. But it's just it's just nothing special in any regard. And, like, some of the ideas there, as I said, some stuff around the displaced migrants, that they, that those are interesting ideas to put in a Disney film in particular. And it's a nice to see that kind of stuff but the actual character work and the actual animation and the actual music it's fine yeah and we saw that in raya as well there's some interesting it's themes. better than raya it's it, way better it, it than is raya. better than raya but there's some interesting themes and ideas but they're not fully realized because disney is afraid to go to those places for fear of controversy you know so it, they, they go right up against it and they suggest it but they don't go all the way in it like pixar would for example as i said i'm willing to give this a second view i think it might be interesting to watch it again in a home environment to see if it's more enjoyable but i came out of it not thinking about it that much where as we said we've been thinking about luca and the songs and the whole vibe of luca for a whole week where this one is just going to quickly fall out of my mind and i'm not going to remember any of these character names tomorrow I didn't remember any of these characters' names now. That's the reason I have Wikipedia in front of me. So I'm like, I can remember the names of the songs and the names of the characters. It's like, nope, all of these are going to go out of my brain tomorrow. And I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, okay. So, you know, if you have a spare afternoon to yourself and you have some kids and it's getting towards Christmas, it's going to be there for the Christmas box office. I think it's worth a trip to the cinema. But if you're not that passionate about seeing it, I, I would wait for it to come onto Disney+. Plus. I think you'd feel less aggrieved having not paid 20 bucks a piece for it. But I also like the cinema. Cinemas are cool. Yeah, popcorn's great. But also there's a pandemic, so yeah. All right, Disney Familia, it's nearly time for us to give our podcasting gifts a rest for another week. So I said it wasn't a gift, Ken. Not listening to me. Your gifted care. Resident Magic by Design singer Nicole is off this week playing the part of Mrs. Claus in an interactive Santa experience. So we won't have a song for you from Encanto. I kid you not, she teaches the kids a little song and everything. It's very cute. Oh, how dare she abandon this podcast to teach children, to bring joy to children at Christmas. Yeah, but uh, I also, um, with Mrs. Claus, it's kind of... Are you Santa? Yes, I am now. Oh my God. (laughs) I just got got Tim Allen. (laughs) 
Hopefully she will grace us with another Disney tune when she returns from the North Pole soon. Anyway, let me tell you that new episodes of Magic by Design land every Monday where all magical podcasts are downloaded. Stop by our website at magicbydesign.buzzsprout.com to find a full list of podcast platforms. We are literally everywhere in the podcast universe. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, YouTube, you name it, we're on it. Make sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Follow us on social media on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash magic by design pod, on Twitter at magic design pod, and on Instagram at magic by design pod. If you're a fan of the show and want to help magic by design end 2021 on a high note, please do consider giving us a review on your podcast platform of choice, share the podcast on your socials, or perhaps recommend the show to a fellow Disney devotee. Yeah, and this is a new review too, so it's like, if someone's saying to you, should I go see Encanto, you should be like, I have the podcast for you. Do you know what? You go up to your friend and you have a good old school conversation. Yeah, even if they hard- don't ask you, force it on them. <laughs> I know it's hard because normally you talk to people through screens these days, but go up to someone and talk to them about our podcast. I think you should turn your podcast on and your podcast listening device on the external speakers as loud as you can, and then just walk through the streets. Forcing people here to, to hear the sound of my voice. If you don't give us a five-star review, our podcast miracle will fade away and be lost forever. Join us next week as we wrap up our look at the existing Pixar film collection with a best of show with a twist. More on that next week, and we'll also reveal all about phase three of the podcast. So lots to look forward to. We don't know what that is yet. <laughs> But we will by next week. (laughs) We'll figure it out in the space of the next seven days. But until then, stay safe and remember, even in our darkest moments, there is light where you least expect it. Thanks for listening and see you next week. (laughs) 